Um, good afternoon. We're going to continue our study on the line simply presented. And I know lots of people have been watching them online. There's not many people here today. Um, but we're going to go through uh, some of these uh, details and in how we understand these lines. So before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful for the time that we have here to study this afternoon. We ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, to teach us. We pray for those watching these videos online, uh, that they can understand what's being presented, that I can present it in a way that's understandable. And um, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can work on our characters that the light that we receive, that we can respond to it and obey it. Be with us now as we open your word together as our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so we're going to have some Greek there in front of us, which we don't need to look at. And um, now when we're addressing these lines... I just want to do a little bit of a review. And, and this review goes to Isaiah 28. So this is where we first started. Now we know that in creating these lines, it's based upon this principle of precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line. Now, when I when I did the initial study, I, I just addressed the meaning of that. Precept is means to set an order. The line is a measuring line, and uh, here and and here, from here and here, is what the Hebrew says, or there and there. And it can refer to time. So what we're doing is we're setting in order upon a line, a line of judgment, a measuring line, um, these way marks. Now, we know that these, um, when we read this, it talks about... Um, these false prophets who have erred in wine and strong drink, they stumble in judgment. Uh, the tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. And then the question is, whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. This progression also of truth from a child who is now uh, growing, but it says, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So we talked about this period of, of darkness, and we can see that this line is given to a people who do not have understanding, they're drunk. So they need to be reformed. And then it says, but the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And my understanding of this verse is that since they have rejected knowledge, or if they reject this knowledge, they will experience these lines. Does that, that make sense? Can you say it again? Okay. So God gives us lines, line upon line. Now, if we follow that, we can be instructed. We can have knowledge. Mm -hmm. We can understand doctrine. Correct. But if we reject those lines, what those lines are are prophesied, prophecies of what will happen to God's people who reject the lines. Absolutely. So the lines will be to them. That is, they're going to experience this history, right. whether either you study it and are prepared for that history or you reject it and you experience that history as a judgment from God. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so then when he says, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, this is Isaiah 28, 16, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. So that's the, 
The vertical lines are the plummet. Those are the way marks. So that's righteousness. So the way marks represent righteousness. The line itself represents judgment. And then it says, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. Now, of course, this is referring to verse 15, talking about the covenant they made with death. So we can see that these lines are reformatory, but they're also judgments. They serve, in a sense, two purposes. I mean, it's really the same purpose. Either you're reformed by the line or you receive judgment from that line. You're going to pass through that history. So, um, so when we were addressing, and I'm going to go to the whiteboard here. So when we were addressing these lines, uh, we addressed the period of darkness. And we also uh, addressed um, the time of the end. So I have to stop sharing. Just hang on. So right from every have the darkness. And then we have the time of the end. So this time of the end is the end of a time prophecy. And we're, we're going to look at that a little bit more. Um, we, we had I touched on it before, but we're going to look at that uh, a bit more when we deal with some of these other lines. But if, if we're going to look at 1798, we know that this is the end of the 1260 and the 2520 for um, uh, the papacy and then for Northern Israel. And then we also know that the 1290 ends here as well. So there's basically three prophecies. These are part of the same prophecy. The 1260 is just the latter half of the 2520, but most people are familiar with the 1260 for the papacy. And so they end in 1798. And um, we know that this is, you know, February 15th. So that's going to be when um, Miller is 16. He turned 16 there, if I remember correctly. I was thinking it was 17 before. Someone has their hand up. Uh, Aran, you have a question? Your hand's up. No. Is that intentional? Uh, I don't remember clicking on anything. <laughs> okay. 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 Okay, so, so um, and then we address that there's this idea of the first message. So the first message is going to be formalized and then it's going to be empowered. And uh, the first message, right, so we're going to have uh, first angel. First angel's message is formalized. First angel's message is empowered. But we also had all of this dealing with the increase of light of Miller. That is, when we looked at William Miller, we could zoom in on Miller himself and see that there is a reform line that addresses William Miller. But that reform line also includes up to the formalization of this message, 1833, when he's going to receive his credentials. But his personal reform line has, does it have the first angel's message being empowered? That is, how did they understand August 11th, 1840? How did Miller understand it? What did they think was going to happen here when they first make this prediction about August 11th? Okay, they believed that this was a close of probation. Okay, so is it a close of probation?
as far as its testing process goes, it could be. Okay, so so even though it's an impairment, it's it's a close of probation. And then Miller is also going to be predicting the second coming, right? I'm going to put the second coming here. And where's the extremity of Miller's prediction? 1843. Okay, At the so end of the wow. year. Yeah, the end of the year, Jewish year, 1843. Now, originally it was 1843, just January to December 31st. When he gets it to the end, December of 1842, he says that it's actually going to be from March 21st, 1843 to March 21st, 1844. And so some people just stick with that. They say that's what Miller said. So it's going to be March 21st, 1844. Um, but but we're going to put that this is um, I put Sunday law there, but it's second coming. Right. Um, so this is going to be uh, April 19th, really, when it starts at sunset. That's going to be the end of the Jewish year, 1843. And so in Miller's personal line, if you look at Miller, um, and we're just going to even put back here, uh, February 15th. So what year was he born? Um 1782, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, which has all the numbers of July 18, 2020 in it. But so 1782, he's born. When he's 16, he receives his concordance, maybe on his birthday. Uh, I understand now that they don't actually have his original concordance. Uh, it was seen by James White but somehow that original concordance disappeared. So they don't have it um, any longer. Um, so they just have the account of James White where he said it was originally purchased for $8 in 1798. So. <clears throat> and they had a family Bible as well that was purchased for $18 and 50 cents or something like that. Um, but if we look at this, this can be Miller's personal reform line. That is, we, we could take events in here and lay them out and say, this is, well, there's a period of darkness before he's born, right? Because he doesn't exist. And this could be the time at the end of the period of darkness when he's born, right? Mm -hmm. And then we, we could lay out events here um, that have to do with, um, his experience, but his line, his prophecy is only going to go up to here. Okay. And so you can see the close of probation and the second coming. And also here, we're going to have the midnight cry, which is that message of Miller in this period, which once they get to the end of this, snow is going to begin the true midnight cry. So in a sense, this close of probation here is almost like the Sunday law as well, because it's followed by, by the midnight cry. So we could take Miller's line and do this. And so what we're doing is we're zooming into a waymark and, and waymarks on a lines above this line can become waymarks on a line, this line below it. And we saw this when we did uh, in our more detailed study, uh, when we looked at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, each of them had a reform line, but a reform, a way mark in Abraham's reform line might exist in Isaac's reform line, but it would serve a different purpose as a reform line. So, so this idea that we can zoom in is one of the main principles that we've learned that reform lines exist everywhere in the scriptures. But reform lines don't just exist by themselves. They exist because there is a larger reform line. Now, um, I'm just going to go and take a different tack here. Um, so when we started our study of reform lines, 
we actually dealt with the period of darkness being the earth is without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. So this was the time of the beginning and we have light that's given an increase of light. And we went through each of the days of creation and showed that they represented a reform line. And so, you know, this would be the first day. And God's going to separate from the light from the darkness, the darkness he calls night, the light he calls day. There's evening and morning one day. And then you're going to have a second day, right? And each of these days here, there's going to be a division, the, the firmament above and the firmament below, right? So there's uh, the waters are going to be separated, right? And then you're going to have uh, the land and the water separated. So you're going to have the seas and the, and the dry land, the Eretz. So there's going to be these three steps. And this is the first angel's message, which has to do with an increase of light and these dividing this result, the, the laying of the foundation of the earth that's going to result. And then you're going to have the fourth day, which is going to be Wednesday, right? So on Wednesday, we're going to have the sun and the moon and the stars, and they're going to be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. Um, now you're going to have plants also created on this day. So the sun isn't going to be created till after the plants are created. So, you know, these obviously can't be periods of thousands of years, because if you created plants here and there's no sun and moon and stars, well, they wouldn't survive, but that's a whole other story. And then you're going to have each of these days of creation. Um, uh, this one here is going to be uh, the fishes. The fishes, I think. Where is the fishes created? Can't remember now. Or the, the, the this is the fishes are here when the seas are done. Oh, birds and fishes. I think it birds and fishes are here. And then, of course, on the sixth day, you have. Uh, the animals that breathe are created here. And then, of course, you have the seventh day where they rest. So you can see that this is a reform line. And uh, the center of this reform line, if you want to put it, the, the arrival of the second angel's message, is the sun and the moon and the stars. And I don't want to go into a long detail about each of these uh, symbols, but this is the center of a chiasm, right? This is the cross and the sun and the moon and the stars are symbols that are symbols of prophecy pointing forward to Christ. Um, and that's why that those are created on that day. Now, this is also our personal experience in becoming a Christian where we're in darkness of sin. Light comes to us and we go through uh, this separation of light and darkness. We start to see truth from error. Uh, we see our sins. God is correcting us. And then um, the heaven and the earth are separated, right? The water or the waters, right, from, from the heavens. And, and then the land and the waters are separated here. And these can represent different things in our experience. But then when we get here, this is where... Um, this first preparatory, the laying of the foundation of the Christian life, which is all about these divisions, because we start to become separated from the world, then prophecy comes to play, because we're now going to have to experience this faith that we had here is laying a foundation to understand prophecy. So a Christian who, who just goes through this experience, they get the foundation laid, but they don't continue to grow in understanding that is when this test comes, prophecy comes to them. I'm not saying that prophecy can't come at the beginning, but this is where they now start to be tested by prophecy. And um, so there's there's a lot more symbols here that I'm not going to address right now. The point that I'm making is in every reform line, we have this darkness. We have the time of the end, or in this case, the time of the beginning. And then we're going to have this progression, this reformatory line, this reformatory movement. Now, now this is, of course, 
the beginning of a line. So if we want to look at the line of creation, we also know that um, if this is creation, we also have at the end here, recreation. That is, this is the heavens and the earth, and this is the new heavens and the new earth. And we're going to see these. <clears throat> now, even though we take this period of 6,000 years, one, two, three, four, five, 6,000 years, right? Going all the way to here, we know that there's going to be the millennium. Now, of course, this new heaven and this new earth aren't created at the beginning of the millennium. This whole thing is a process of the creation, the recreation of the new heaven and the new earth, right? Because the earth is going to be destroyed. And this itself is a reform line. That is, we could go here and look at this history and see a reform line here. Right? So when we, we get to, this is the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, sixth day, you know, we have the seventh day. So, I mean, if I'm putting these at the start of the days, that's how we would look at it. And the seventh day is going to be rest. Now, in this case, what's going to rest? during the millennium. The earth. Yeah, so the earth is going to rest during the millennium. Right, so it has to rest before it's recreated because the land has to keep her Sabbath, right? So this is a sabbatical cycle of thousands of years. So each one of these days of creation aren't a thousand years, but they do typify periods of thousands of years. Now, of course, when we look at these way marks, uh, we know that the flood isn't going to, it's going to happen in uh, 1656 be, uh, years from creation. But we would normally place these different way marks as these, uh, events in earth, earth history. So here we put the flood, right? And so we're going to have this, this history, this line, and I'm not going to go into it right now. Um, now, some people try to take this very literally. That is, they want to have each of these thousand years being marked by an event. Now, one is, you know, when Jesus was crucified, you know, there are people who want to have him crucified and it be exactly 2,000 years from the crucifixion to uh, the second coming, right? And we know that Usher, he had um, creation in, in 4,004 BC. And then he's going to have Christ's birth in 4 BC. But we know that that's not correct. But he was, he was using this idea of um, th th that there's 7,000 years. Now, when did his 6,000 years end? If, if 4,004 4, BC was the creation, where did 6,000 years end? 1996. Yeah, so 1996, right? So so this would be 1996. Now, it used to be that Christians really liked Usher's date because, especially in the 90s or the 80s, because they were saying, well, the world's going to end in 1996. Christ is going to come back because that's 4,000 years from creation. But what happened within Christianity after 1996 is people started to shorten this period because people still want to have Jesus come back exactly 6,000 years from creation. Now, what are some problems with that conclusion? What are some things that 
that would be a problem with saying it needs to be 6,000 years from creation and that we're going to just keep changing the date of creation so that the second coming of Christ is still in the future. There's a few problems. What, what's one of them? It would be, uh, be like a type of time setting. Okay, it's a type of time setting. Okay. But do we, do we mark 6,000 years from creation or 6,000 years of sin? Well, I think uh, Ellen White, she does say 6,000 years from sin. Okay, yeah. So, but uh, I think she does also say like other statements about 6,000 years relating from creation. Would that be correct? Yeah, but so she sometimes just rounds off to 6,000 years. Um, you know, because interestingly, when she talks sometimes about dates in the past, she will say, you know, something happened 500 years before Christ was born. But sometimes she'll say it's 500 years before the cross. And, of course, there's an extra 30 years in there. So when she's doing some of her statements, they are rounded off statements. But it's pretty clear that she sees that sin obviously occurred not at the day of creation. And she talks about 4, 000, or 6,000 years of sin. Um, but we don't know when Adam and Eve sinned. Now, I mean, we can speculate on it, but we just don't know. So, so there's a question there about the origin of sin itself. When did it occur? Now, another thing is that we obviously have 40, 46 B.C., for the creation. So this is Asher. And, and this is me. So that's what I have. Um, and so that's going to be 42 years difference. So, you know, here we would have this then be 1964, right? If we're going to go from creation itself. But people keep wanting to, to push creation this way so they can have, you know, it in the future, the 6,000 years. But, of course, we don't know what it is, whether it's from sin or from creation. I would say it would be 6,000 years of sin that are going to then be marked. Now, why would I say it's 6,000 years of sin? What would be a good argument for that? Because if we're using this as a type, when does darkness begin if I'm going to start the 6,000 years or the 7,000 years? Okay, so, so God creates the world. If there's no sin, there's no darkness, there's no way that that 6,000 years begins, Right. Do people agree? Yeah, we know, we know that uh, sin is at least, you know, occurred um, before, well, Seth was 130 years yeah. after creation, and then before that was Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. So we don't know exactly, but we know they were adults anyway. We don't know exactly how old they were, but we, the understanding yeah. is that they yeah. would be probably about 30, 40 years old or whatever. So you can go back. So maybe we don't know how long it was to fight sin, but it wasn't probably wouldn't be more than 100 years yeah. since, uh, since creation. It's in yeah, so we did. So we could say, no, definitely not more than 100 years and probably, you know, less than that. Maybe it was 70 years, right? Well, 70 years, I have an interesting theory. <laughs> okay, what's your interesting theory? <laughs> okay. So um, I think in 2026 or around that time or 25, Yeah. we, we are 6,000 years 
and seven, six thousand and seventy years from creation. Okay. So um, I'm just thinking, um, if if the millennium, we we in a sense, if if the millennium was to occur after six thousand years, we've kind of, in a sense, borrowed time from that. And um, if 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 there was going to be if God the Lord was going to go return or whatever if if, if he had a lot like an extra seventy years probation in a sense to the earth and maybe borrowed it from the millennium that would leave the millennium being nine hundred and thirty years long rather than a thousand years which kind of mirrors Adam living for nine hundred and thirty years so you have nine thirty years at the beginning. And then nine thirty years at the end. Just a just a thought. Yeah, and so there's lots that God hasn't really shown us, but we do see these structures exist, and and there are hints of them. The thing that I can say is that we can't use the six thousand years to predict when Jesus is going to return, because we don't have all the information. Um, now, of course, uh, We're not to right. But, but I don't think that information was given us, right? So we don't have that exact chronology of when sin began so that we can count it out. Um, so there could be other possibilities. Now, um, the other thing is we know that time is, in some ways, time is going to be shortened, but also God's mercy is being extended, Correct. Yes. So, so how do we understand those seemingly two contradictory concepts? Time being prolonged and time being shortened. It's lengthened in the sense that God is merciful. Okay, so God's merciful. He's going to give us some more time for a certain period. But it's shortened in the sense that we're nearing the fill of our yeah of our probation in our like we're not in, we're not improving so therefore we're nearing the uh, the limit of our sinfulness okay so he's going to cut it short in righteousness so so both are are able to be true to be true okay <laughs> i just got an echo there um, so, so I just wanted to go back and look at this and understand that, um, that the idea of darkness, that here in the creation of the world, this darkness is chaos, right? Here, if we're going to deal with the 7,000 years, um, we really need to go to, uh, sin as the start of this. Now, even when we look at this period, um, there's a lot that goes on in here dealing with uh, the patriarchs. We know that, you know, we have Methuselah when he's born. We have uh, Lamech when he's born, Noah when he's born. And these are our precursors to the time of the flood. And actually, if we were going to look at a reform line of the flood, the, floor, the reform line of the flood is not just the flood. It's actually the events that precede it. Mm -hmm. Would we agree with that? Well, it would have to, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, so when would be, when would the flood begin as a reform line? Well, I would think uh, the beginning of the 120 years. Okay, so, yeah, so we have the 120 years in here. But isn't it maybe even before that? Because people start getting wicked before then, and then God tells okay. Noah to build the ark. Right, right. so there's going to be 120 years probationary period or whatever you want to call it that exists. Um, 
But we know that normally a reform line, the period of darkness, uh, ends with a time prophecy. Right? But this is actually beginning a period of darkness with the time prophecy to the flood. Right? So we're going to have darkness here. Sorry? Somebody say something? Stephen yeah, the, the, dark, the darkness being that the sons of God are nigh with the daughters of men. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's not just the sin. So when we went through this before, we looked at the progressive destruction of four. How we ended up getting to that period of darkness. And then we're going to have this 120-year time prophecy. So we don't specifically have a, a time prophecy that starts uh, this time of the end for the flood story. But we do have some prophesying um, because we have Enoch. Now, what is Enoch prophesying? The second coming. Yeah, so Enoch's prophesying the second coming, right, way over here. So now we know Enoch's going to have a son, Methuselah, and Methuselah is going to die in the year of the flood, right? Mm -hmm. When he dies, it shall come. Mm -hmm. So how do we relate this flood then, this reform line, how do we relate it to the second coming for one? Because in this history, are they looking, in a sense, for the second coming, the, which would be the first coming? Yes, but they're, they're mistaking it for the second coming when it's a type of the second coming. Right. So, so they may not know all of this history. No. They just know that, that, that sin is going to be dealt with at some, some point. Now, here it's going to be dealt with water. At the end, it's going to be dealt with by fire. I don't think they could understand it properly. So we still have prophecies here, but we just don't have a time prophecy marking the time of the end. But, but we can see that we have this connection that this history in here is that, th that we, you know, we wouldn't just mark a thousand years to the flood, you know, cause it's 16,056 years to the flood from creation. We don't know how long it is from when sin first originated. The only thing we do know is that um, there's going to be a prophecy of 120 years. And this is going to end when Noah is 600. So this prophecy is given when Noah is how old? 40, I think. Yeah, 480. And what was the significance of that, Stephen? Well, it worked into like a, a chiasm. Or you had 480. Um, well, this is maybe not what you're thinking of. There was a chiasm with that 480 there, which, which kind of merged the 480 with the Solomon. Yeah, the 480 was Solomon's temple. And so we had a span of time between these, and Solomon's temple is completed in what year? Uh, 1006. No, is it? 2006. Okay. And then, and how but, many? I think it, was, it wasn't to this. It was to the, the start of that uh, for 10, 10, 10, 13 was the, oh, the so end of the, the foundation. Right. So he lays the yeah. foundation in 1013 BC. Yes. Yeah. So we know this is 2390 BC. So this is what year? Uh, two five ten. Two two five ten BC, right? Yes. Okay. So you have so you have four eighty, then you have one twenty. Yeah. And then um, you had one twenty. Was it? Um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> so, um, wow. But I haven't got the diagram with me. I'd have to okay. look at it. <laughs> so, so I think it was um, 
777 years was connected uh, to the birth. Oh, right, okay, you had the birth of uh, Moses. Before you had a 120 there, Moses yeah, led 120. Okay. So I'm just going to put it here. We're and then have... that was followed by 480. This is Moses. Right. Yes. And then you had 120 for him, and then that took you to the beginning of the 480. Because it was coming out of crossing of the the, the Jordan, coming out of Egypt to the south. Yeah. So, so the this temple. brings you to the, the period that's going to start a period of 480 years. Yeah, so you've got like a chiasm there. So you had 480 followed by 120. Now we have 120 followed by 480. And then between that time period was 777 years. Right. So when you go between here and here, right, it's going to be 777. Is that what it is? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we got um, this 480, 120, and a 120 and 480. Yeah. The midpoint was 2001 BC. What? Um, the what? The midpoint was of the 777. Of the whole structure, yeah, the midpoint was 2001 BC. Yeah. Okay. Now, you know, we're doing a bunch of things. Is this is supposed to be a line simply presented, I realize. Um, but what we're trying to understand here is that this history is, is very detailed. That is, when people approach prophecy, what I see is very simplistic approaches that people try to fit uh, these lines in. But we can see that there is multitudes of connections. There's, there's just all kinds of connections, structures that bring these together like a wheel within wheel. But if you try to play around with these structures, what would happen to these structures, Stephen? Would they exist? They wouldn't work. No, they wouldn't work. And, and so we're dependent upon these structures. But remember, the structure, the, the dates, the chronologies were given first. And then we found the structures. Um, so what we want to, to look at now, so we've got all of this sort of background. So when we look at a reform line, again, we know that there's this darkness, and you have the time of the end. You have a cre increase of knowledge. You're going to have, so we're going to say this is the first, you know, the second way mark, the third way mark. And these are all under what we would call the first angel's message. Right? Mm -hmm. So you have the first angel's message. It has three way marks to it. And then you have this period. And of course, I probably should do this because the first angel's message ends when the fourth way mark happens. And then this is going to be the second angel's message. Right? And in Millerite history, uh, we mark these, you know, as 1798, um, 1833, August 11th, 1840, April 19th, 1844. This is July 21st, August 15th, and October 22. Right? Mm -hmm. So why do we have this separation of the first and second angel's message? And why, when the third angel's message arrives, because we're going to look at this later as well. So I'm just trying to give this overall view. We have the first and second angel's message, the third angel's message arriving in Miller, <coughs> the close of probation. 
But this is also a close of probation. Right? And in Millerite history, this is the Protestants. And this is the Millerites who are being tested. Right? Okay. Now we believe that we're repeating Millerite history. Um, and so when we draw our line, and we have this darkness over here, uh, this is 1989, this is 1996, this is 9 11. This is 9-11, and this is midnight, which we don't know where it is, and this is the midnight cry. These are future, and then this is going to be the close of probation, right? Or I guess it the Sunday law the it's the Sunday law for Seventh-day Adventists, but it, it is a close of probation as well, yeah. just like the one above. So this is then... Uh, the way your, that we uh, look your commas tilting. Well, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, that's good. There. So this is Seventh Day Adventists. And this is. Okay, well, maybe we should look at it this way. Okay, who's being tested here? Let's let's ask this question instead of me telling you. You already know the first part. Seventh day Adventist. Well, what particularly? Church structure, the leadership. So we'll just say the church. And we'll call this the people. Okay. Right? Because I was gonna put like the seventh day Adventist church and then the Seventh-day Adventist people, right? So the church structure itself, now, now I put this here as 9-11 um, just because we have, have these two 9-11s, they're still really one event. So when the church closes its probation, just like the Protestants did, it's actually going to happen at 9-11 itself. So, you know, I don't know because these are both 9-11, I'll just put it there. So in this case, if we're looking at this line, this 9-11 is uh, actually 9-11, the church has closed its probation. But if we're looking at the people, we could, there's another 9-11 in here. So I, I, don't, I don't know how to represent it. Um, just because they're both the same event. But we'll just we'll just put it there like that. I mean, I could just put them together and just say, you know, this is 9-11 or something like that. But this event here is August 11th, 1840. That's 9-11 where um, the message is empowered, right? But it also... The church closes its probation because the second angel arrives at 9-11 as well. But can we see that this is actually two different lines? Two different lines as in one's the Millerites, one's... No. Even in here, when we have 9-11 serve one purpose and 9-11 serve another purpose, mm -hmm. that it's actually two different lines that are being represented. One line for the church, one line for the people? No. Okay, let's let's look at it this way. So I'm gonna get rid of all this.
So you got 1798. I'm just going to put the one, two, and three here. Whoops. So this is going to be April 19th. Eighteen forty-four, and this is going to be October 22, 1844. So these are when these angels arrive. Now, what does Ellen White see next on the line? Sunday law. Okay, so she sees the Sunday law, which is the fourth angel, right? Mm -hmm. And then she sees the loud cry. And then she sees the close of probation, right? And then the seven last plagues, and then the second coming. Correct? Right. Mm-hmm. Just look at this. Okay. So that's what Alan White sees. Now, she's paralleling the loud cry and the Sunday law with it, history in here. Sunday law would be parallel with July 18th or July 21st, 1844. And the loud cry would be parallel with the midnight cry because that's what she does indirectly, right? She definitely gives that the midnight cry parallels the loud cry that comes after the Sunday law. So you have to have the Sunday law here somewhere. And we would call that midnight. So you have midnight, midnight cry. This is, in a sense, midnight, midnight cry on this, this big line. And you're going to have this fourth angel coming. In this history, we have what happens under the second angel's message. What, what two messages are given? Babylon is fallen. Okay. So you got the bridegroom and Babylon is fallen, right? Behold, the bride and groom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and Babylon. So in this history, we also have Babylon is falling, right? And those messages then are the loud cry, if we want to put it this way. That is the loud cry. Is Babylon has fallen. Right? Come out of her, you know, there's a call to come out of Babylon, which doesn't really happen under the, the third angel or the second angel's message here in this first three. So Ellen White looks at this line. If we look at what's happening here, we know that this history is going to be repeated in this history. Right. And and here we have this Sunday law, loud cry, cry, close of probation. But when we look at our line, it's going to have the Sunday law here. So we're and the Sunday law is going to be the actual Sunday law. But we 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 have this line that goes from 9-11 and then we have midnight and midnight cry. But we can see that this midnight cry comes before the Sunday law. Ellen White says the loud cry comes after the Sunday law. So in this line that we have, we have 9-11. Um, and what is 9-11 here? April 19th. So this is April 19th, right? So can't we see that this part of our line that we have developed is actually a zoom into another way mark that is separate from this line here where we have um, 1989 as the time of the end, because this is a repeat of this history. And, and then when we have um, these events, we're going to have um, 
you know, 1996, the formalization of the message. And then we're going to have August 11th, 1840, right? So that's going to be 9-11, right? So this is the empowerment. So you're going to have the first angel arrives, the first angel is formalized, and the first angel is empowered. It's here where the church's probation closes. Right? 9-11. But it's the empowerment of the first angel, but we say it's the, the arrival of the second angel. So the second angel also arrives in this history at 9-11. But can we see that 9-11 shows up in two different reform lines? Yes, I get your point. Okay. So that this is actually a separate reform line. So, but it's, so Ellen White said, has, what's that? You were telling, um, and, um, the church structure, that was uh, the closure of probation there was uh, for the Protestants lining up with uh, the fourth, 19th of the fourth month, 19th of April. Okay, yeah. That's the 19th. So that, yeah. So that was a close of probation for Protestants. Are you kind of like, uh, by saying it's August 11th, 1840? Yeah. You're sort of making, even though that wasn't a close of probation. They thought it was. But, huh? They thought it was a close of probation. Yes, it may be typified happened at uh, April 19. Okay, so so when the Millerites looked at August 11, 1840, they believed it was a close of probation, but it 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 wasn't though. In a, in a sense, it typified that. Um, and in our history, we can see that August 11 serves the same purpose. Now they were looking at, of course, the close of probation before the second coming, right? Because they believed the second coming, they believed all these events were going to happen uh, prior to Christ returning because they needed the seven last plagues and all this, this stuff to occur. They cast that aside as time went on. Um, and and they, they moved the close of probation even to uh, the first day of the seventh month in 1844. And then... And, Finally, they had it at October 22, and then eventually um, most Adventists abandoned that, right? So, so what I want to show is that in Millerite history, there is, right? So we're going to say this is a close of probation, but we also had August 11th, 1840, that was perceived as a close of probation, So these parallels between these histories need to be understood. Now, and I've been trying to figure out how to present this simply. So it's not the easiest thing to do. So. So what we're going to do next week. So I, I've, and I've been really struggling with this. So I know I have to present these lines simply. But what we want to do next week is, is I want to backtrack again. I want to go over some of these things. Because um, I don't think I don't think I understand the lines as well as I should. Because the more I study them, the more I see. So it's like every time I go over these lines, I start to understand them better. So Obviously, I could study, understand them better. Um, and in trying to make things simple, I definitely need, I need to know what points, because um, I just keep seeing things. So, so I need to know what points people need to understand. So people who are watching these videos, I want to have feedback. Um, you can write your questions or your comments on the video itself on YouTube. 
um, what kind of things you're having trouble understanding, or even any ideas you have about these lines. But the basic principle that I see is that, that we didn't understand well enough is that when we zoom into a way mark, we have a different reform line that that has shares some of the same way marks as another reform line. And so we can see that in Miller. He has a reform line. It goes up to the end of his prediction. But that's that's not the whole reform line of Millerite history. Because Samuel Snow comes in and he has a reform line. He has a reform line of his letters, which we're going to have to look at and understand. But also he fits into this midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law scenario with the first day of the first month. So hopefully this is going to be helpful, but I really do need feedback from people. So even if you think some of your questions are um, basic, just write them down on the YouTube video and this will help me prepare uh, for next week. Any final comments? Okay, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the study today. We ask for a blessing for the rest of the week in our morning studies. I pray that you can, that your angels can watch over all of those who are studying truth, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts, and that you can teach us, help us to learn of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>